Hello friends and welcome to Career Stock. I am Suran Sharma, a senior consultant based in Netherlands. And today we are going to discuss Agile Project Manager interview questions shared by our WhatsApp group member. These questions were asked in actual companies. And to help us, we have a Karabi Bharadwaj with over two decades of experience in project management. And friends, this is part two of the project management series with Karabi. The link to part one can be found in the description, which you can watch later. And part three is coming soon. So to ensure you don't miss any upcoming discussions, make sure to subscribe to our channel. And if you find value in our content, which I'm sure you will kindly, I'm definitely kindly encourage you to show your support by liking this video and sharing your feedback in the comment section below. So let's welcome our guest Karabi. So thank you for giving your time today, Karabi. Good to see you again. Thank you so much for inviting me once again in your channel, Sunan. And uh, before we begin, I must say that the last few uh, YouTube videos which you have published, they were immensely helpful because I had some of my peers and I myself too uh, had been watching them till the end. And it is a very, very good initiative from your end. So thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. So if you allow, uh, shall we start? Today? Yes, please. Okay, good. So uh, the very first question is uh, share a situation where you had to build a high performing agile team quickly. And what steps uh, did you take to ensure that team was effective from the start? Arabi? Right. So since you asked me to share a situation, so the situation was, you know, it was a large project for one of the US Fortune 500 customers. And the customer was into development of ingredients for food and beverage industry, right? And they are one of the number one numerous, you know, in, in the world to, in doing so. They have presence in, in uh, across the world, including India and Netherlands as well. And uh, when I joined that particular project, it was already in a very, very, I would say a boiling situation. The customer had complained of immense delivery issues, uh, especially leading to the quality and the delays in delivery. So, so quality and schedule were impacted. And the team, on the other hand, they never had one voice, a, a unified voice, to kind of negotiate with the customer and voice out what the challenges were. And there were internal conflicts in the team. Uh, the team size, I need to call out, it was a large team size of almost 20 to 22 FTEs alongside the contractors. And uh, the contract uh, period was for about uh, two to and a half years, and it was uh, a $1.8 million contract. So this was the landscape, right? And uh, when I joined, uh, we had two PMs already working in the account. I was uh, kind of mandated to provide an oversight to the entire project. And uh, when I understood that, uh, that you know, there has been disconnect between the customer and our team. The disconnect also existed within our team members. What I did immediately was to sync up with the stakeholders at the customer's end. Although I had no previous relationship, uh, you know, established well ahead uh, before this TRCO meeting, but still I went ahead and uh, requested some time from the steering committee members. I have never uh, gone uh, with any resolution or solution in my head to the problems that were cited many times with the PMs, but rather I was there to understand and jot down the pain points that the customer is experiencing, right? I never offered any solution on that particular call. I just jotted down the uh, pain points. Uh, because at that point in time, I thought that they needed someone to listen to them, not to provide a technical or a process oriented solution, but someone who's going to listen to them to understand their challenges. And then when I had a kind of a meeting with the two PMs who were leading this entire project, I understood the challenges that they were facing. Uh, Specifically, if I would like to call out that the BA team said that the uh, customer has been always changing the requirements even after the sprint goal has been achieved and we have demonstrated the outcome in this at the end of the sprint. And the development team says that they were not always very clear around the acceptance criteria and the test criteria. Hence the development thought of tweaking certain workflows which was not up to the mark as the customer expected. What I did immediately was to uh, 
I mean, take a consensus from the 2 p.m. and basically bifurcate it or probably, you know, divided the teams into small scrum teams so that this each scrum team can compose of uh, the multidisciplinary team members, including the BA, the Dev, the QA. And I wanted them to talk in one common language, right? So, for example, if I'm sa saying something like data, people should not misunderstand thinking it as a database. Right. So uh, providing them with a common platform where the team talks in a common language was a great help because while doing so, the team members, then they understood each other, their thought process, their lingo. It is very important to understand someone's lingo as well. Right. And uh, you see, uh, in your question, you have highlighted high performing team, right? Uh, we all notice that any high performing team has a lot of energy, has a lot of vigor, has a lot of happiness and the laughter, right? So those few things, they were completely missing when I actually took over that entire project. So it was my duty to uh, provide a platform where there is complete trust accountability, collaboration, openness, and most importantly, they needed to understand each other's how they were doing work, each one of them. And that provided the needed energy, they needed laughter, the vigor, which translated into better quality uh, because the QA team has been working closely with the BA team. Similarly, the tech team, they were also working closely with the QA team. The, set, the third thing probably which, would, uh, which I had done is to basically ensure that the customer is not supposed to sign off on any user stories unless the user stories are accompanied with a proper UI, BDD, and a proper acceptance criteria. If these three things were missing that were made mandatory from my end, no one is supposed to sign up the user story. So once these three things were done, uh, we saw a lot of improvement in terms of cohesiveness of the team in bringing our team with in front of the customer. So much so, probably at the end of third or fourth sprints, the PMs or the Scrum Master, they were not driving the customer call or the sprint demo. It was the team lead, the BA lead, they were driving the demo and the product owners from the customer side, they were also kind of engaged and they understood what a user story should be, what are the different attributes of a user story and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, inconsistencies, a lot of communication gap, misunderstanding, they were kind of erased out. So this is how I dealt with that situation, Sunant. Wonderful, uh, Karami, for that uh, detailed elaborated answer. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, let's move on. Yeah. Okay, so the next question is, let's say you have been assigned to lead a new team for a DevOps transformation project. So how do you set a clear vision and mission to align the teams towards the goal of this continuous integration and continuous deployment, CICD? Right. So, uh, you know, DevOps is not a trend it has become a part and parcel of our culture. Instead of a trend, it has become our convention. Uh, DevOps, to me, it is not limited with the realm of IT. It goes beyond IT. I have managed quite a few critical DevOps program for companies, including IBM, Microsoft, and now Aviva, including my earlier product company, Blue Coco, right? And the customers, uh, they were from various industry vertical. But a few things which I have found common is that in order to undergo any DevOps transition project or a transformation project, we needed to understand what are the underlying conditions of this transformation exercise, right? Is it because of merger, acquisition, divestiture? Is it because that the company is thinking of launching or repivoting its product and services to acquire new customers, new geographies, new ways to do business? Or it is as simple as to they are looking to reduce cost and, you know, do away with the inefficiencies. It could be so that they are likely to fix certain system or the process gaps. So once the leader understand what are the underlying reasons for taking a transformation exercise, the next thing we need to do is to identify the teams or the business units who are going to be impacted. 
uh, because of this transformation exercise. So once we understand who are the business units who are going to be impacted with this transformation exercise, we needed to identify a group of team members a group of team members who would likely to rally around this entire transformation initiative. Third point, which the leader needs to do, and this is very important, is to identify the low hanging fruit uh, because a DevOps transformation, it is a huge initiative. It's a huge program, right? So there might be multiple work streams under this program. So we needed to identify what is the lowest hanging fruit that is ca that can be taken up by the teams, which will give the team uh, immense confidence. And it is going to help establish the transformation office in front of the entire organization as a turnaround office, right? In DevOps, as we understand, there are three or four core words uh, on which we need to focus on. One is the repeatability. The other is consistency. The other is confidence, right? So once we provide some kind of a common platform, giving the team some kind of a goal that these are the underlying conditions for which the DevOps transformation exercises are taken up, we also need to give the team the confidence that this is the lowest hanging fruit which the team can do in this uh, schedule and the budget constraint. We need to celebrate the success of the team in front of the entire organization so that the senior leadership, they have confidence on the team and they know that the team is now kind of ready and all the team members, they are jogging in a particular rhythm, right? That rhythm is very important. So that covers the functional aspects or the business aspects of a business transformation exercise. The next aspect is definitely in providing a necessary IT infrastructure to the team so that they can, uh, you know, leverage on the infrastructure, go on with their continuous improvement, continuous deployment, and of course, establishing the OKRs, the various KPIs and the OKRs. Say, for example, the mean time to repair and the code quality. Um, if you will allow, Sunan, then I would like to highlight one of the profile which we usually use as uh, in the program level to kind of show the DevOps exercise and its. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, please. Go. Yeah. I thought this this may come in handy for some of our peers or viewers in your channel. So these are the DevOps profile. I'm not able to see using. anything. You're you're sharing your screen. Uh, I am, but uh, let me see. Just just give me one second, please. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, do let me know if my screen is visible. Yes, I can see DevOps profile. Right. So this is nothing, uh, and this is definitely with not the real data or the real information. What I'm sharing may help the program managers and the project managers to set up the DevOps profile for their own transformation exercise. So what is the cycle time in terms of when the definition of done or the definition of ready is, is kind of ready in the pipeline? and when the developers are picking up those user stories that will help establish the minimum cycle time and will identify any cause of delay. What is the mean time to repair any piece of code? And this specifically goes for the projects that are into the service delivery, that are code service delivery projects, right? The deployment frequency and the code health. There could be other KPIs as well, but these are some of the basics which we may use. This covers the technical aspect. So in my response, I covered both the business and the functional aspect and the technical aspect. Now, coming to the core uh, response uh, against your question as to how I would like to uh, set up the mission and vision, I think, first of all, understanding the reasons of taking a transformation exercise is very important. Once we understand the reason, it is very important for me to provide that 
that reason so that all the multidisciplinary team members they are brought on a common shared platform they understand why we are taking up such an exercise identification of the business units and the teams who are going to get impacted cause of this uh, exercise identifying the lowest hanging fruit that could be taken up in a minimum time so that we can establish the value of the transformation office as well as particular that initiative providing an open environment to collaborate to communicate and of course setting a clear expectation from the team as to what is expected and by which time so these are the few steps which i think one could take to set up a clear mission and vision in front of the team members okay thank you karavi and you have to unshare yeah like this <laughs> You have to unshare your screen because I can see a black screen. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, wonderful. You have explained it quite, uh, yeah, in a, in a nice way. A small thing I just want to add to our viewers that we have created one session long time back uh, with with Dora matrices. So nowadays uh, these Dora matrices are also picking up whenever people are talking about DevOps. So if you have a time, just look into that as well. Apart from what Karabi have shared. So yeah. Okay, thank you, Garabi. Let's uh, move on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So the next question is about the stakeholder. So let's say, let's say that there is a key stakeholder, and uh, that holder, the stakeholder, will have a significant influence. You know, and uh, frequently changing the requirement uh, in in the middle sprint. So how are you going to work with? How are you going to manage these kind of uh, influence to ensure that your project is stable and you know leads towards a success. Right, right. Um, I think you know the response to this question is actually hidden in the in the question itself, because you have asked me that the stakeholder who is having a significant influence on this entire project is doing this thing repeatedly, right? So any seasoned PM or a program manager or a lead who is who is uh, providing an oversight to this initiative. if they are understanding that this is kind of getting repeated i think they can perform a few steps to bring some of the data point in front of the stakeholder and if the stakeholder is not understanding they can easily escalate it to the steering committee these steps will definitely include if the stakeholder is present during the product backlog grooming session if they are present while the sprint backlog grooming is kind of underway and the sprint goal is established right if they are present then what are the kind of feedback which the team is getting from that particular stakeholder and during signing off of the user stories if the stakeholder is present and if the stakeholder is also reviewing this user stories before signing off right so these are the three things which the pm or the scrum master also needs to observe so the availability of the stakeholder in all the product backlog grooming sessions the sprint uh, goals establishment process and the user story sign up process needs to be understood and when we see that there is a common pattern that the stakeholder although they are present they are not saying much but whenever they are seeing the outcome at the end of the sprint then they are actually changing the uh, scope or they are coming up with new requirements it means that that the stakeholder doesn't have much clarity uh it it can also mean that without seeing something very tangible in front right the stakeholder is unable to visualize what is going on as a part of the system so even before uh, hitting Uh, as an an in an escalation mode and going going to the steering committee i would advise talk to the stakeholder 101 provide the data point that hey you have been present in this sessions but we have not received any significant responses around the user stories and around this go from you but whenever we are publishing the sprint Uh, in the production or in the uat deployment uh, environment then only a lot of feedback is coming is it because you want to see a proper ui workflow in front of you right that is that going to help you uh, to determine if the user stories are correct or not so basically take the stakeholders provide a walk through to the entire figma or the canva or whatever tools which the project team has been using and take him into the confidence but if this is continuing for say three or four sprints of course do not mind to kind of change the scope 
but uh, analyze the impact in terms of effort, in terms of cost, and take it up with the steering committee. Okay, uh, thank you for that, Kavi. Okay, let's move on. Yeah. So uh, it's a kind of behavioral question, but I think it's a kind of practical question, which I'm sure like all the check managers and scrum master face, that how you're going to provide a constructive feedback to your team member. So if you can, you know, uh, come up with some example that how you have done that. And the moreover, like how it going to help the performance of that individual and how it's going to contribute to the success of your project, uh, that will be really great. Karabi. Right, right. So we all receive feedback and we also give feedback, right? I think one of the particular thing about the feedback is the person who is providing the feedback, he or she needs to set a clear expectation. What is this feedback all about? And what is the change that he or she is expecting from that particular team member? So once that is clear to the feedback provider, it is very easy, right? Uh, sync up on a 101 and understand uh, if that particular change could be incorporated, right? So for example, in, in one of the recent project, I was... Uh, I was noticing that the BA team has been doing a wonderful job in capturing the requirement, right? And they have termed that entire exercise as a requirement capturing and analysis initiative from the BA. I will highlight one of such use case wherein the BA team, they were kind of trying to gather the requirement that said a lot of data related inconsistencies, uh, a lot of manual update, of the data in disparate systems, leading to a delay in generating a critical finance report, right? So this is all great. This is an example of how the, the team member has come up with the requirement, but this is not good enough. Why it is not good enough? Because it doesn't provide or, or specify example of what data is getting entered by the users manually. Who are the users? In which system they are using? And why is the delay in generating the financial report at the end of the year or at the end of the quarter, right? So for example, if the, if the BA team member would have used that, yes, um, as trivial as a customer ID, Right, customer ID across different systems can follow different nomenclature, but they are all aligned to the same enterprise account. Hence, at the end of the quarter, when the finance team is generating, say, for example, uh, a total uh, value for that entire contract, the total contract value, with, which we usually say, they are unable to. Uh, find a consistency and they're unable to correlate which customer ID is aligned to which enterprise accounts, right? Because one enterprise accounts will have only one customer ID, but the number of customers on that enterprise account under that enterprise account may differ, right? There can be a master service contract. For the, for the entire enterprise and say the customer ID is C001. But the customers could be from say Belgium, one could be say from Sri Lanka, one could be say from India and so on and so forth. So the, at the end of the quarter, the finance team, they were having issues in correlating that these customers are indeed to be tagged with C001 because they are all uh, you know, available in disparate systems. Right. So this kind of specific examples, which systems are this, who is entering the manual uh, data and what is the issue? If it is not called out specifically, the requirement becomes a very subjective requirement as opposed to an objective requirement. Right. So once I understood that this is what I expect, it was very it was very easy to have a sync up with 101 and help understand the BAT member if this could be achieved. Now your question also has a part wherein how this feedback can be given, right? So first of all, 
understanding of of what we want the expectation and then a 101 definitely not in front of all the entire team members the intonation of the person who is providing the feedback needs to be very warm it, it cannot be challenging or confrontational, right? Because we have to understand if this can be provided, if such a specific example or a use case can be designed or not. The BA might have thought about it, but there might be some challenges, so we do not know, right? So I think in a very psychologically safe environment and in a very non-formal way, if we take up the feedback with the team members, all good. And, and the and the expectations and the quality from that team member will definitely improve. Definitely. Definitely agree with you, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's move on. So uh, this is again, uh, kind of uh, more over on a budgeting part. So if you can, you know, uh, describe a time uh, when you anticipated a future budget challenges, you know, in any of your project development project. So what kind of proactive measures uh, we have taken to address those kind of challenges and what was your approach? So that's the question, Karabi. Yeah, I think it's a very good question because your question aptly highlights future budget challenges, which mean the PM is already analyzing the forecast, understanding the consumption of the effort across various sprints at the sprints as progressing right and they are understanding that there could be a potential cost overrun right so highlighting the risk in advance is one of the best acumen that one can get from a seasoned pm right now once we understand why is this cost overrun the situation is going to happen is it because that we have not been able to provide our effort estimations properly or because of because the complexity of the project is such, we were unable to have a complete visibility around the scope and the complexity in the initial stages, which is very common, nothing wrong about it. Or it could be a problem around the capacity allocation in the statement of work itself, right? When we, when we uh, were allocating the capacity, when we were assigning uh, the resources across various products or its service lines, we were unable to, uh, you know, design a complete model how the capacity allocation and the number of headcounts that is required to, del to deliver this kind of product. Or it could be that because the customers, they are changing the requirements too often or it could be because of certain external but mandatory dependency which has suddenly cropped up. It's any legal or a, any uh, country specific compliance issue, a regulatory issue, right? So first of all, we need to understand why is this happening? Once we understand that, the best thing is to uh, flag it out to the steering committee so that their expectations are kind of set up. They should not be caught blindsided and analysis of the rate of consumption is very, very important. That's a KPI which every PM or the Scrum Master should be publishing at the end of the sprint, right? It is not about how much effort has been consumed against a fixed particular capacity. It is about the rate of consumption. If we are observing that there is certain spike, whether it's a downward spike or an upward spike, we have to understand the underlying reason. Now, because of very trivial reasons, as I said, the customer has been changing the scope or because of certain external mandatory regulatory uh, reasons that we needed additional capacity, it is easier for us to negotiate with the customer, right? So that we can have a buy -in. But for more difficult reasons, say for example, in the statement of work itself, the capacity was not designed properly because we were unable to fathom the complexity of the project or maybe the consumption of effort had suddenly spiked up because of certain complexities which we did not see. Those were, are a bit difficult conversation. Uh, it will depend from organization to organization how such situations can be managed. But I would like to say that in Microsoft, we used to be provided with uh, you know an enterprise uh, fund and uh, the PM, or the, or the uh, senior architect, we used to go to that uh, committee meeting and we have to provide them with full justification saying that boss, this is something which is at our end. 
during the statement work designing phase, we were unable to understand the exact capacity required, or we were unable to understand the complexity of the project, right? That's where the senior leadership used to provide us with an enterprise fund. And then that enterprise fund has, has to be monitored and controlled very, very closely because it is coming out from the portfolio kitty of the senior leadership, right? Uh, it can be that the project needed to undergo a change request as of course, because there is going to be a cost overrun. And sometimes the customer used to kind of fund us as well. So it depends on, on the organization's process, its assets and the customers. That, that's all from my end, Sunil. Wonderful, uh, Karavi, thank you for that. Uh... If you allow, shall I also share one of my uh, past experience? Oh, yes. That will be wonderful. Okay. I'll just uh, try to complete it in short because you already elaborated it. So I was uh, managing a software development project for a bank. And uh, we are aiming to develop a new mobile banking app with a lot of advanced features such as, you know, real-time fraud detection, personalized financial advice, and you know, seamless integration with the existing system. So what I believe that if you are a experienced project manager, you will anticipate all these kind of budget challenges initially. So for example, in our case, we know that there are a lot of regulatory compliance, as you also mentioned, right? So this banking sector is heavily regulated. So we have to ensure that there are a lot of compliance with all relevant laws and regulations that is going to be a costly for us. Then we have something called security requirements. So we implement uh, all these robot security measures, right? To to protect all the sensitive financial right. data. Again, it's going to be cost us or it's an expense for us. And then the third party integration. So these kind of projects require integration with multiple third party services. So for example, mm. credit scoring, payment gateways, and which again have some potential hidden cost. So if we anticipate these kind of challenges uh, in the beginning that we can do something about it. So for example, if we, uh, you know, initially we come up with our planning and risk assessment. So we conducted comprehensive uh, initial planning sessions with the development team, stakeholders, compliance expert to identify all the regulatory requirements and all these potential uh, security challenges. So we, we created a detailed project plan which uh, clearly defined the milestones and all these regulatory checkpoints and these security audits. And again, we also uh, engage all these compliance and security expert early in our project. And that would definitely going to help in a long run. People believe that right. it's a kind of overhead, but it will uh, prevent it, all these cost last minute, you know, changes, and that's going to create more expensive and more cost rather than bringing all these, you know, uh, experts early, early in yep. the project, yep. possibly. Yep. And uh, we can, you know, do kind of negotiations uh, all with our vendors. It would definitely, definitely safeguard, you know, all, all these contractual obligations at the, the last minute. So negotiating with third party service providers will secure a lot of favorable terms and we can define our clear contextual obligations to avoid all these unexpected costs at the, at the last hour. So I think these are the few things which uh, we have done. Sure. I mean, we've done a lot of things, but just to uh, tell you, and then of course there is something, as you also mentioned, we have a contingency fund. So we allocate a contingency fund within the project budget to cover all these unforeseen expenses related to compliance, security, all these integration True. issues. True. So that will provide a financial buffer to address all these unexpected challenges, you know, without uh, jeopardizing the overall project budget. Got so it. yeah, I mean, these are the few proactive measures which which thing we have taken, and you know, yeah, I mean, it is definitely going to help uh, us in that particular project. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for bringing out the issues in the banking and the finance industry. Got it. Okay, okay. So let's move on to our next question, which is that if you can uh, give some sort of examples how you plan and manage resources within your IT project, and you know what are, what kind of different challenges which you have faced, and how you overcome all these challenges. So I think this is one of the most asked question and. Take your time, elaborate it. I think you have a couple of slides also with us. Please go ahead, Karabi. Yes, right. So uh, this question, when you when the interviewer is asking to the interviewee, uh, you have al already you know, explicitly called out that you are trying to understand if the interviewee has experience in managing any 
I mean, managing the resources uh, in the project. Now the resources could be people, it could be, uh, it could be you know, infrastructure, it could be inventory of any other systems or applications. But here it seems it is mostly related to the people part of it, right? Now resource management is a, is a broad term as, as we see it. It has resource planning, resource uh, acquisition. Sorry, so, sorry Karabi, actually uh, we hate these word resource. Like we, we never use these words resource for our actually for our employees. But but it's still like there are a few people who use these words. That's the reason we are, otherwise I never call my team members a resources, you know, I mean, so sorry, just to, just to clarify. No, you are very otherwise, right. Otherwise you will get a lot of comments on this only like, how come you're telling us as resource? Yeah, I mean, I do agree. Like we are not a resource, we are human being with feelings, right? So yes, sorry, <laughs> Kavar, please go ahead. Right. Uh, but again, you know, to your uh, viewers of your channel, they are they are very experienced. Sorry, audience. sorry again, sorry again. It's not my channel; it's our channel. It's our channel, them. right? Including again, me. please go ahead now. They are very matured and they are very seasoned as well. As I have seen some of the comments, some of their questions, right? Uh, till the people, they are doing any work in the project till the time they are doing any work they will obviously be called out as resources once they have started doing the work in the project they are a team now right and resources again doesn't mean only the people it also means a lot of the infrastructure lot of equipments lot of vendors lot of systems and applications here for the sake of simplicity in trying to provide a response to such questions, we are assuming the resources means teams and people, right? So for the, uh, to, to keep everyone happy, maybe I'll just use the term capacity, right? So the capacity management will depend on a lot of factors, including the scope of that particular project, the schedule, the budget, what the objective, the non-negotiables, if any. Uh, now, these are some of the things which probably I, as a, as a PM, would like to understand from the stakeholders who are assigning me the project while trying to allocate the capacity and manage the capacity, right? Uh, mind you, you know, uh, from the time I have actually started working at the program level and at the product level, this is something which I have been doing. Uh, this is my day job. This is this is what I'm doing more as opposed to doing anything else, right? The capacity management. And yes, Sunant, uh, you have allowed me to share a couple of slides so that uh, the viewers of our channel can understand what we usually do in companies like IBM, Microsoft, Aviva, and, and they can help themselves ramp up accordingly. So if you will allow, I would like to share my screen once again. Yeah, please, please go ahead. Yeah, do let me know if my screen is visible. Yeah, I can see DevOps profile. I think you have to jump Right, in. right. Simple overview of steps to capacity plan. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> For some reason, it is blank because, okay. Yeah, so let it populate completely, correct. So I will not read aloud all the important points, but these are some of the steps which we usually do in such organizations when we are assigned to a large and a complex enterprise level program. Say for example, a transformation program, we need to understand what are the work streams under the program we need to identify various projects under these work streams. We need to understand the various tech stack which we'd be using. Obviously, it is not something which the program manager will do alone. He or she needs to sit with the architect, the sales team members, and the pre-sales team members. And then we need to raise the resource requirement with the resource management team. 
we need to understand and analyze the budget which has been put forward in the statement of work against various roles. We need to identify what is the key product capabilities which we need to produce at the end of the projects. We need to, at a high level, plan the sprints. I mean, just schedule the sprint and do a high level sprint release planning exercise internally, even before we are engaging the entire team for this project. And then we will do a detailed forecast to align with the sprint capacity and the goal. Now, everything cannot be done all at once, but these are some of the steps uh, or maybe thoughts which the which the interviewee needs to say to the interviewer because these are these are something which i have been doing and i'm sure you are also doing this is something which we all of us are doing in our real life now as an example when we say define the work streams what do we mean by that and then when we say define the projects what do we mean by that so sunant here uh, say for example uh, in case there are three companies, say company A, company B, and company C. And company A has acquired company B and C. Now such acquisitions, when it happens, then the transformation initiative kicks in, right? It means that there are certain systems which needs to be consolidated or condensed. It can so happen that there are certain, say, financial systems, manufacturing systems, uh, HR systems, collaboration systems, all the systems need to be condensed so that the levers and the joiners process, it can be identified as a work stream. Then we have, uh, say so the collaboration, it can be identified as a work stream. Then we have the finances, it can be identified as a work stream, right? Now, when we say finance process, I'm just giving you a hypothetical example, and it is been called as a work stream. Under that finance process, we can, take up different endeavors or different projects so that different financial systems are integrated at least tactically in the short run and then probably will be converging in the long run to one single system. It means that a transformation exercise needs to have two steps. One that is going to provide an immediate benefit and the other that is going to provide a long-term benefit. So once we do everything, the next thing which we need to understand the difference between the delivery hours, forecast hours and budgeted hours. And uh, here I would like to first of all, you know, take the viewers on this uh, left hand side uh, thing, wherein we have highlighted as a hypothetical figure, say this entire project is going to cost about $300,000 with a 700 hours capped. It means that whatever we do, we cannot go beyond 300,000 unless there is a change request and a change approval process which has been initiated. And then what do we mean by budgeted hours? Budgeted hours, we all know that it is actually 700 hours and it is coming from the statement of work and the equivalent uh, dollar value of this budgeted hours is 300,000 and it's again as a hypothetical example. Then we have the delivery hours. What do we mean by the delivery hours? See, when we are loading team members into a particular uh, project, we are loading it based on the country where the team members are, the rates against the roles which the organization, the commercial uh, unit of the organization has provided to us. And we also have already defined at a very high level, what is the capability or the product which we need to produce and how many sprint usually it will take to produce that particular capability. Seeing all those three or four things, we can define the delivery hours. Now the delivery hours may be same or less than the budgeted hours. And then we have the forecast hours. It means that against each of the team member, how many hours of work we are forecasting each month or each week. These forecast hours may be less than or equal to delivery hours, right? Forecasting is a living thing. It means that on a weekly basis, we will forecast based on the consumption pattern, based on the uh, you know, progressive visibility of the dependencies and the scope which is emerging in front of us. And this is what we do, or at least I do as, as my day job, which is allocating the capacity. Say, for example, the project is, is a migration project. The roles uh, 
will be like the architect role will have a couple of engineering role. The skill set probably we are migrating into Azure platform. The delivery hours you will see the architect has been loaded with 200 hours, whereas the uh, lead engineering team members, they are loaded with 300 hours. And then the other team member, again, from the engineering uh, team, they are loaded with 80 hours. So the total delivery hour stands at 580. But you see the budgeted hours was 700 hours, right? So it means that the PM is kind of very confident that we will be able to finish a bit I mean, uh, within the budgeted hours. And in fact, we can save some cost and time for the company and for the customer. And then we are forecasting. Forecast is essentially done on the visibility of the scope and the dependency and the user stories, the effort which has been estimated by the team member. And then you will see that we will align the rate against the particular role. And on an actual basis, this is what the team member is clocking in our labor clocking too, right? So from the right hand side onwards, where we see under the actual, we see the different dates like 2nd to 6th July, 9th to 13th July, and so on and so forth. This data point like 2, 3, 5, 7, and 10, these are actually the hours which is coming from the labor clocking tool, which all the organization usually have. The rate is provided by the commercial entity of the organization. The total actual hours is, of course, the summation of all the actual hours which is been provided here. Forecast is something which we are doing depending and, and after talking with the team members and the delivery hours is, is what is we are incorporating as a uh, from our own uh, experience. The other thing in this particular uh, format I would like to call out, you see the, mic, uh, the architect, uh, the delivery hours is 200, the forecast hours is 180. So one may ask what happens to the 20 hours. We can say that we are saving cost for 20 hours or if needed at a future point in time, we can reallocate this 20 hours to the architect or maybe reallocate this 20 hours to any of these engineering team members who may need additional hours. One thing very critical for us to note that the rate of the architect, the role of the, uh, of the architect and its rate may not be equal to the engineering rate. So whenever we are reshuffling the hours from any role to the other role, you know, we need to be mindful so that the rate is not impacted because once the rate is impacted, it means the, there is going to be a potential of cost overrun. Then these are some of the explanations which the uh, viewers and my colleagues who are watching this channel, they can, uh, you know, leverage. Uh, like the budgeted hours was 700, the total budgeted budget in dollars was 300,000 in the left hand side. Uh, uh, and then we have the delivery hours, it means the sum of total hours for all resources loaded in the project, which will be less than or equal to the budgeted hours. And then the weekly or the monthly forecast, which is leading to not more than delivery hours. We usually do this forecast weekly. This is coming from the internal tool. And then again, you know, uh, what, what is meant by the budgeted cost, budgeted hours, delivery cost, and forecast hours. And these are some of the, on the right-hand side, you will see what is the freedom given to the PMs, which is we are allowed to load more or less number of people, team member, I have just called it out here as resources, keeping the total budget unchanged, raise a CR so that it is agreed, baselined, and documented if we need, if we are seeing that there's a potential of budget overrun, we can split the hours between multiple roles, as I have explained, that we can take that 20 hours from the, uh, from the architect and assign it to the engineer. Keeping the total budgeted hours for that particular role unchanged, it should not shoot 200 hours. Caveat that if the rate for the architect role is $70, then advise to allocate remaining 20 hours such that the rate remains unchanged, so the engineer who is allocated this additional 20 hours, that role has to have $70 as a budget, not more than that. It can have less, but not more than that. And depending on effort, sprint goal, and actual consumptions, weekly forecast is advised to control the schedule and the cost. And revision in forecast is a common exercise despite effort estimation at the start of the sprint due to changing complexity, elaboration of the scope, dependency, and reusable codes, anything else. 
so this is what i i thought of you know uh, presenting to the to my colleagues and to the viewers of our channel this is what is meant i think one part of the answer of how we manage resources or how we manage the capacity right and then of course the pms who are working on individual project they are going to control and monitor the consumption they are going to understand if there is any spike in the actual consumptions the rate of consumption and so on so forth then the financial metric will be consolidated against that particular program budget sunil over to you okay so this answer is absolutely great for the interview but i mean you and me always know that that there is no budget which is always uh, sufficient for us so friends uh, in actual working climate we have to do lot of dirty work which we don't have to do but believe me the job of a project manager is not easy there is uh, different kind of pressures which we have uh, pressure from upper management and pressure from lot of places even i can't tell you and we have to do lot of things which we are not supposed to do uh in order to do all these budget check and balance so believe me when we have this we spend lot of day and night on this to to make these numbers to make our project portfolio program profitable there is immense pressure nowadays even on project men so if you're just thinking it's just about coming and just you know talking to few people here and there and do something on excel sheet and it's more than that believe me okay okay let's not reveal some insider information karabi so thank you emotions aa gaye the na so so that's what <laughs> sometimes you know yeah you yeah know, i am also i am i am always kind of counting my fingers like 2 plus 3 4 4 plus 5 6 <laughs> and then i am always chasing the team members if you are taking leave if you are then who is going to do the job? how many how many hours we are expecting there are I mean, lot lot of things there are lot of things lot of things we but have to fun. do something it's fun yeah okay so thank you karabi for uh, being with us sharing all your knowledge and friends uh, if you enjoyed today's session don't forget to like and subscribe and stay tuned for more because we will definitely have more sessions with karabi she is pretty busy nowadays but i have to keep on chasing her so yeah i mean that's okay that's between you and me so until next time take care everyone bye and we love to see your comments some awesome comments you guys are uh, sending us we both are reading your comments and then discuss discussing on all these comments what we can do better what what we can incorporate in our next sessions so please please put your comments we definitely love to know what you think about these sessions you know things which you don't like about these sessions also so we'll you know we'll not going to repeat we'll all we'll improve these. yeah we'll yeah. definitely improve right so with this uh, thank you karabi and uh, thanks everyone bye bye thank you bye. so much thank you, thank you.